Thank you very much, Susan, for those kind words. I would like to thank Mort and uh, Ruben and the committee for inviting me here. This is a fantastic meeting. It's always a great honor to be here. Thank you so much. So I was given the job to argue for MRD. Is MRD the same for novel agent as for transplantation? And uh, again, the right answer to the question is yes. And I will now walk you through new data in support of it. Uh, if you look in the, in the pamphlet, there are actually a couple of sub-statements uh, linked to this debate. Uh, the first one is, does MRD inform about the need for transplants? And the right answer to that is yes. Uh, the first question we were all uh, given here in the morning to vote for included actually uh, information that I will now show uh, as part of this answer. I will start with a publication from the New England Journal. I thought why not put a New England Journal paper here to begin with because everything that's published in New England Journal is of course always right. So uh, I took the study, the termination study that was published last year uh, using uh, RVD or VRD for three cycles and then randomized on the left to arm A five more cycles so there was no transplant patient underwent collection before they continued with five cycles and one year of maintenance and on the right collection of stem cells receiving a transplant two more cycles of the same combination and then one year of maintenance this study was designed to look for progression free survival and the winner is the right arm the transplant arm PFS was better, 61 versus 48% for three-year progression-free survival. Now, if you look beyond the primary endpoint, why was PFS better? Because there are more patients, and pay attention here, this is what we were asked to, to answer this morning when Suzanne pulled up uh, the three options. There are more patients having a deeper response in the transplant group. That is why PFS is superior in that group. As pointed out in the New England Journal in the editorial uh, by Jeff Saunders and uh, Dr. Schiffer, uh, they pointed out that more sensitive tests for minimal residual disease may prove to be more informative going forward. The group uh, that published this paper in the New England Journal, uh, the French group presented at the subsequent ASH meeting this uh, updated uh, uh, slideshow and they broke down uh, the two arms into MOD negative and MOD positive. And as you see on the right, uh, you have the transplant arm, MOD negative, and then on the left, the MOD negative in the non-transplant arm. The PFS is very similar. And if you have followed the literature online, it just came out in print in blood just a few weeks ago. The final analysis using MOD 10 to minus 6 using the adaptive 2.0 assay. And here are some very important pieces of information. I wrote them down in three bullets. The first is <coughs> patients with high risk cytogenetics who became MOD negative, they had better PFS than standard risk patients who remained MOD positive. This tells us that MOD is a more powerful predictor than cytogenetics. MOD negativity was associated with longer PFS in both the high risk and the stan standard risk patients. Again, tells us that MOD is more powerful than cytogenetics. And lastly, this is the answer to the question we were given before. More patients in the transplant arm achieved MOD negativity. However, PFS was the same for patients who were MOD negative independent of treatment. This is very important. So I think we are at a point where this map we have used for a long time probably could be called the old treatment paradigm for our newly diagnosed patients. I do truly think we are at a point where this should be the new model. We should think of MOD-driven therapy going forward. I recognize that we don't have all the randomized phase three data in multiple studies, but this is a debate and I'm here to argue for it. I do think this is going to become the future. We can look for MOD status, we can offer patients to collect and go right to maintenance if they are negative. And for patients who are not candidates, they would still go straight forward, which we are already doing. I think it's fair to say that there is no survival disadvantage uh, in this current time. Maybe PFS is slightly less good uh, if you choose to hold off, but there is also a price to pay with a transplant. But I do think the IFM study is very, very supportive of this idea. 
So if you buy into this, there is no more induction therapy because there is no con consolidation therapy. It's all about combination therapy. <laughs> so moving forward, does MOD also inform about the length of therapy? Now I'm entering an area where there's less data. So I have to extrapolate a little bit from the literature. The answer is still yes. I'm here to tell you yes, all the way through. Looking at the newer combinations we heard from previous speaker, Dr. Mikhail, on the new combinations that we have now used for some years and some of them for less than a year. This is the ASPIRE trial. That was the first combination study showing a tremendous uh, extension of progression-free survival. This was recently updated in JCO, lead author David Siegel, showing there's an overall survival benefit using KOD over RD. We also have seen, again, in the New England Journal, the Pollock study and other studies uh, on, on different combinations. The Pollock studies show that there is a significant progression-free survival benefit using daratumumab with Revdex versus Revdex. For all of us who treat patients every week in our clinics, we know that all these therapies are great, but we also know that many patients reach a point where the patients say, do I really have to come back for all these infusions? There is this treatment fatigue. So extrapolating from the newly diagnosed patients and looking at the data, I will not take you forward towards MRD. Let's take a look at the Pollock study. The Pollock study randomized DARA, Revdex versus Revdex. If you look in MRD uh, distributions within this study, if you just focus on 10 to minus 5, which is what currently is acknowledged by the International Myeloma Working Group, you have almost 25% of these patients reaching MOD negativity. Patients on this trial were treated with one to three prior lines of therapy. This is a transformative study. For the first time, patients who were relapsed refractory myeloma could reach MOD negativity. This is, this is huge. So why could you not think about this as an extension going forward, thinking of maybe guiding the therapy with MOD? Looking at MOD, it happened from the very beginning up to almost one and a half year into the, into the treatment for the combination. So here's my thinking. We have patients on combination therapy. If they reach MOD negativity, and we can even confirm it, why couldn't we think of maintenance therapy even in early relapse? The same way that we do it in the newly diagnosed patients. And I would actually like to challenge you all and say we already do it. I see a lot of patients coming to clinic, they are treated with these combinations, and over time, when the patient is complaining that there are too many infusions, we start peeling back. And many times we end up using only one of the drugs that we had in this triple drug combination. We certainly would not do that for a patient who has active relapse or has still residual disease. We would only do it if the patient really reached a good response. So I actually think we're already doing this. So lastly, how could we use MOD to inform about maintenance? Does it actually do it? Yes, it does. What's the data for this? I share with you in my clinic. I have a large clinic. I see a lot of patients. I only see myeloma these days. For patients I treat with combination therapy, when they have finished that, I put them, almost all of them, on Revlimid maintenance. I offer them, and most patients, they choose to do so. I used to check once a month. I no longer do that. I do labs after one month, additional two months, so this is now three months into the maintenance. And from that time point, in my clinic, I do every three months. What I do is that I repeat the labs. I do a spot urine. I do not do repeated 24-hour urine. I offer patients who are on maintenance to do a bone marrow biopsy, and I offer a PET-CT on an annual basis. I do not force that, and I say that there's really no clear guideline saying that, but I would offer patients. If patients have drifts off in their labs, I would certainly check maybe a month later or two, depending on what it is. But if everything is stable, I only see my patients every three months. I have many patients who have been MOD negative for four or five years that I follow in my clinic. If a patient were to recur in my clinic, most of them would present with a biochemical progression. There would be drifts in the M spikes that could go up, the light chains could go up, 
also the uninvolved immunoglobulins could drop, or a combination of those. A small proportion of my patients have pain, kidney failure, hypercalcemia, unfortunate pathological fractures, or other issues. That's a very small proportion of the patients. Our current thinking is based on the guidelines. The guidelines that we published, updated in 2016 for response and recurrence of myeloma. I think these guidelines need to be updated. I think they are a little bit outdated, and I'm blaming myself. I'm one of the co-authors. I think I'm listed as the fifth author or so on this paper. When we updated this uh, guideline, uh, we focused so much on death response on MRD. But the definition for progressive disease is the same definition we have had for a long time. 25% increase from the lowest confirmed value in one of the following criteria, the M spikes or the light chains, or we can look also for the urine protein if none of the blood markers have done. For the most part, this means that the M spike has to go up by 0.5, because there's also an absolute requirement. It's not only the percentage, it also absolute number has to be more than 0.5 grams per deciliter. That's a lot of protein, that's a lot of disease. It makes no sense to have that if we're looking for MOD on one side of the spectrum, and then when the disease returns, we just sit and watch, and it just goes out of control. There is no defined laboratory cutoff that triggers restart of treatment. I would say typically, worsening of the overall labs or onset of symptoms certainly would trigger retreatment. I think we all would do that. We all know and we can see in every study published that the duration of treatment in the relapse setting gets shorter and shorter as the patient has more and more relapses. The therapy lasts shorter. So there is something we do wrong. So for the purpose of this debate, I was looking through my own data. Patients who have been MRD negative for a long time, when they, if they convert back to positivity, how long does it take for them to develop symptoms? There is not a whole lot of literature on this. In my hands, in our hands, at our institution, it ranges from just a few months up to more than one and a half year or so. Why couldn't we think of approaching that? We are waiting for this M spike to go over the 0.5 grams per deciliter. But waiting, we know, also involves worsening of the disease. We're waiting for the disease to further evolve genomically. And we know that the disease will respond shorter and shorter to combination therapies. So I'm here to, again, be a little bit provocative as part of this debate. I think it's time to think about clinical trials. I'm not telling you to go home and do this, because there is no data to 100% back this up. But I think we are at a point where this really needs to be studied. Could we think of switching from maintenance to combination therapy if patients convert to positivity? Again, this is not an established criteria, so do not go home and try it. Don't try this at home. <laughs> and then go back maybe to negativity. We have actually just started a trial where we give a six-month duration of added monoclonal antibody CD38 to maintenance. And there are, of course, so many other options. This is not necessarily the most uh, sophisticated idea, but there could be probably a lot of other things could be done with vaccines or other combination therapies. I think this is a huge area for drug development. So lastly, I have one and a half minutes left. Where do I see the field going? We are going for earlier start of treatment. The criteria are updated. We have better machines. We have better assays. We can detect disease earlier. People are more aware these days. We have many new drugs coming. There will be better drugs coming all the time. We have CAR T cell therapy that can deliver MRD negativity. We are investigating four drug combinations uh, in the newly diagnosed patients. All these different components have one thing in common, deeper responses. MRD. So I share with you some of the work that we have been developing. We have developed a single tube 10 color MRD negativity assay for flow cytometry of the bone marrow. We have set up an in-house VDJ tracking using next generation sequencing of bone marrow. Both these two assays we have in-house today and we do a standard of care. We can find signatures of recurrent disease, and in small proportion of patients, we can track new clones. We also have 
in our research lab, ongoing work both on circulating tumor cells and cell-free DNA. We are very far along with low levels protein in blood. In one drip of blood scanned for 10 seconds, we can find low levels of disease, almost as sensitive as the bone marrow tests. And lastly, we have also started doing uh, radio-labeled antibodies. We started off in mice. And here you have a CD38 labeled antibody we have given in mice, and you see myeloma in the mouse. And we have also done it in patients, and we can actually see the disease with these radio labeled antibodies. So, summary conclusion does it inform about need of transplant? Yes. Inform the length of therapy? Yes. Inform about maintenance? Yes. I would like to thank all my collaborators and our funding support. I would like to thank you so much for your attention. Thank you.